Hello. Good evening. Good evening. Hello. Hello. I got Hello. audio. Can you guys hear me? How are you doing? Okay. Yes. yes. So nice to see you. It's a pleasure to have you here. Uh, how can we call you a professor Anderson? No, I'm, I'm not a professor. The only teaching <laughs> I ever did, did have done was with Signum. Um, so I, I don't um, qualify for being professor. So just call me Doug is fine. Uh, I, I, we know you are qualified. You just don't yeah. have the <laughs> certificate, let's say. <laughs> Uh, it's uh, uh, an honor for us to have you here. We know you are uh, an old school token. It's like Ronald here. Uh, I'm going to present everyone so that you can know us a little okay. better. Uh, I'm Sergio, as you can see. Uh, uh, Sergio, I'm founder of co-founder of the channel, Token Talk YouTube channel. Uh, our channel has now five years of many videos. I believe more. we have more than 800 videos now. Uh, wow. reviews, book reviews, uh, legendarium, token biography, we talk about everything. And this year, we are starting this series of international interviews with the famous tokenists or people who are famous or, uh, or important to the scene, to the tokenist scene. Uh, with, with, me to, with us today, we have Inês, she's from hi. Portugal. Inês, nice say to hi to you. <laughs> Hi, it's such, such a pleasure. Are you actually are you actually in Portugal? Yeah, so I'm, I'm I'm Portuguese. Yes. <laughs> okay, so you must be what about five or six hours? Uh, here <laughs> is uh, 10 p.m. Okay, okay, it's only six here. And what <laughs> is hours. it in Brazil then? Yeah. Brazil, it's seven seven p.m. now. Seven p.m. Okay. Yeah, and because our team is 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 uh we have about 12 people more or less who work with us all volunteers and many people spread around Brazil and we have Inês in Portugal, our representative there. Uh, very nice girl, she studies a lot too and she has a, a long yeah. future ahead. And I also. The Mr. Ronald Kimsey, he's uh, our mentor. He has 40 years of talking society membership. He is translator of- 40. Has tra yes, 40, yes. 40. <laughs> He has no, we're translated the close then. <laughs> <laughs> he I, has think translated... I, I think I joined I joined the Tolkien Society in 78. So I've got oh. about 43 years. Yeah. You got an edge on me there. Yeah. I think <laughs> my yeah, my membership is from 1980, I guess. And he he's also translator. He has translated uh, something like 20 books by Tolkien and Long career. You, you, he's uh, our mentor. He's our model uh, of token studies here in Brazil. And Hodge can can say hi to Doug. Hello, Doug. I've always wanted to meet you face to face. It's not quite face to face, but it's an honor for me also to be in in, in your virtual oh, presence, you. so to speak. All right. Wonderful. Well, it's nice Wonderful. to meet everybody. Very excited. Thanks. And the other guy here is my friend Cesar Machado, also the co-founder of Token Talk YouTube channel. Oh, uh, 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 he's a consultant, tokenist consultant to HarperCollins Brazil. He has been working with the late, later, late, uh, uh, later books because uh, we have a new translations, uh, new editions here since 2018. And Cesar is working with all these books uh, from recent years. Cesar. Hello, Mr. Doug. Hello. Or just a Doug. It's a great <laughs> pleasure. And about the new books we are publishing in Brazil. This year in July, July no, in June, we're gonna publish the annotated Hobbit in Brazil. Oh, good. That's good to know. I haven't read yeah. Portuguese yet, but I, it's been in, in Spanish in Spain. And it, it, there's been a number of other, you know, translations here and there from Japanese to Chinese to Hungarian to whatever. But it's good to be to be in Brazil. Then I have I have a slight 
personal connection with Brazil in that um, when I was 10 years old, we hosted a foreign exchange student from Brazil for the for the school year. So um, I don't remember much about it that long ago, except <laughs> I, I still remember some of the uh, naughty words he taught me. As a <laughs> <laughs> Definitely is a Brazilian. Yes, what a so where, where are you? Where are you all located in Brazil? Then are you all in Rio or are you down in Sao Paulo? Pardon? Sao Paulo. Cesar and Ronald, Sao Paulo. Sao Paulo. And, uh, Ah. I am from a I am from a city called Fortaleza, uh, which means fortress, but I live in another city called São Luís, uh, Saint Louis, in the northeast of Brazil. Oh, okay. In yes. The northeastern in corner. Here is hotter, much hotter than São Paulo. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, now that we know each other, and uh, again, it's a uh, real pleasure to have you here. It's been a long time since we wanted to talk to you, uh, and now finally we'll do it tonight. And we will begin with a small introduction about Douglas A. Anderson's life. And now Inês, Cesar, and Ronald will give our audience a brief background about Douglas. Okay, so I will start with a little bit of your biography. Douglas Allen uh, Anderson was born in the late 50s in Valparaíso, Indiana, known as writer and editor of on, on the subjects of fantasy and medie medieval literature, he specialized in textual analysis of the works of J.R.R. Tolkien. He is the author of the acclaimed The Annotated Hobbit, and for, it, and for this, he won the Mythopoeic Award for Scholarship. Together with Berlin, Berlin Flieger, Douglas edited a new expanded edition of Tolkien's On Fairy Stories. Douglas is currently book reviews editor of the peer reviewed online journal of Tolkien Research, founded in 2014. His anthologies of fantasy literature include Tales Before Tolkien, 2003, and Tales Before Narnia, 2008. More, tale, more Tales Before Tolkien is due out in 2021. He is also managing director of the small publishing firm Modens, Modens Books. Modens. Nodens. Nodens. Nodens Books. Uh, besides his blogs on Tolkien and fantasy, mostly Tolkien related, and a shiver in the archives, which highlights literary discoveries, he contributes to the blog Wormwoodiana, devoted to classic literature of the fantastic, supernatural, and decadent. He also does a personal blog for lesser-known writers. With Michael D.C. Drought and Verlin Flieger, Douglas Anderson was co-editor for volumes one through eight of Tolkien Studies, an annual scholarly review. He is a member of the Board of Academic Advisors for Walking Tree Publishers, and of course, of the Talking Society for more than 40 years now. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so I think we can begin now. And the first question, as usual, is how and when did you first get in touch with Tolkien and his words? And also, what is your favorite book? Um, when, in the summer of 1973, when I was 13, I was visiting my older sister, who's nine years older than me, um, and I was bored out of my mind, and I was looking over her bookcases and complaining there was nothing to do and there was nothing to read, and she stomped <laughs> in from the kitchen, and she pulled out the four of the Valentine volumes of The Hobbit and Lord of the Rings with those uh, Barbara Remington covers. And she thrust <laughs> them at me and she said, here, read these, you'll like them, now leave me alone. <laughs> <laughs> and so I thought, oh God, only my sister would like um, some book titled The Hobbit. I mean, her reading at the time period was, um, was um, Richard Brodigan's um, The Revenge of the Lawn. 
um, which is an odd title. And, and so I, the, the Hobbit just sounded to me like an odd title. I didn't know what, what Hobbits were or anything, but I took it in the first volume of the Fellowship um, home and, um, and I read them right through. And, and I called her up and I said, oh, you have to bring me the next two volumes. I need them. And she's like, well, I'm coming tomorrow. And I'm like, no, I need them now. <laughs> so she brought them over and uh, and that was my first exposure to Tolkien. It sort of grew in various ways over the years. Um, in my freshman year of high school, which would have been 73, 74, um, our English teachers wanted us to do a, to divide up into groups and perform a drama. And they threw a bunch of plays on the table and they were all Neil Simon plays, which I had a precocious disgust for, even at age 13, um, and said, I wanted to do The Hobbit. And they said, no, there's no dramatization of it. And I said, well, I'll write one. <laughs> and so they said, well, if you write one, we'll let you do it. And we did. And I did it with my friends and the teachers liked it so much that they took us around to um, half dozen elementary schools in the area to perform it. So, um, you know, and then from there, I just started reading more and more. Um, the Ballantine adult fantasy series was in its last gasps um, in 1974. And I started reading those and I just started wanting to read anything more either like Tolkien or that might have inspired him. And um, and I got to know more about you know his life as Humphrey Carpenter's biography came out. And and then we could follow people of my age could get a new volume of the history of middle earth every other year or every year for you know for quite a few um decades and um so it's it's been a it's been a journey um and along the way one gets interested in certain aspects of it um i got interested in bibliography and in publishing history and with um when I um, was working with Humphrey Carpenter on his Auden biography, um, which came out, I believe, in about 81, he, um, he needed a research assistant in the States because Auden spent a lot of time in the States. And so um, I was doing this stuff for him on Auden, and we used this wonderful bibliography um, by Barry Bloomfield and E.C. E. Mendelssohn of, um, of Auden. And that sort of inspired me to want to do one, you know, of the sort you know, on Tolkien and learning the publishing history was interesting. And um, Wayne Hammond and I combined to eventually do that. And so, um, but, but there's all sorts of little aspects of that, you know, recur or, um, um, you know, you, you find you're interested or you're not interested in it. And, 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 you know, and this year, but five years later, it's like of great and absorbing interest. I'm sure you've all hit mm -hmm. aspects like that yourself. Because Tolkien was was so um, widely ranging in his thoughts and interests, so following him around is not a bad education. And your favorite book? The Hobbit. <laughs> <laughs> no, everyone expects. No, the it never has been. <laughs> when, when I did the annotated Hobbit, I I had um, I started textually because I wanted to know what were the precise changes that Tolkien made between the various editions. So I took five different editions of the books and I photocopied them and I put them on these foot and a half by four foot sheets, taped them next to each other so I could read the text straight across and um, you know had a big huge table to do this on and I had different colored highlighters to mark oh this was the first edition checked that in in uh, you know orange and this is what it got changed to in the third edition which is green or you know I don't remember the colors precisely but um, I had gotten to know the publisher of Tolkien at Houghton Mifflin his name was Austin Olney and um he, I, I, um, I told him about this and I said, and it was 1987. And I said, um, I said, well, I've just done all this work on the text. Well, I had thought about doing a very Orem edition of the Hobbit. Um, but there isn't enough changes really to justify that. So I thought, well, with the 50th anniversary of the American publication of the Hobbit next year, how would you like an annotated edition? Because there's all this other neat stuff you can say about it. He said, oh, that sounds great. And so it progressed slowly from there. Um, but no, The Hobbit has never been my favorite book. I, um, Lord of the Rings was always my favorite book. Um, the Hobbit, when I started to do the, ho the, the actual 
annotated Hobbit, um, my goal was I wanted to take a characteristic Tolkien text and show the different ways to approach it via his scholarship, via his other works, via his artwork, via his poetry, just everything, and, and come at it and try to use it as a primer, I guess is, is, is a good word for it, a Tolkien primer and that. Um, so um, that was the impetus to it, but it was never because The Hobbit was my favorite book. <laughs> and I'm not, I'm not saying that I don't like The Hobbit, but um, does that, that yeah. gives you somewhat of an answer. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so uh, next, let's go to the next question. Uh, from being a mere Tolkien fan, how did you become a Tolkienist? What was the trigger? Um, no one trigger, just several. I went to school um, in my um, first year of, as an undergraduate, there was posters up for a summer program in Oxford. And so I signed up and, and was accepted and I, and, and I spent the summer of 78 in Oxford. And, and um, that's when I got to know a bunch of people in the British Tolkien Society. And I um, wrote to Humphrey Carpenter and asked if he might meet me and sign a copy of his book. And he did, and we got to know each other. And it was through that that I got to know that you know Humphrey needed some assistance in the US for his Auden work. So he asked me, and we traded stuff, um, worked back and forth for years. Um, we were very close through the early mid eighties and that though as his interest drifted away from Tolkien, mine of course, you know, concentrated more on it. And he put me in touch with Christopher and, um, you know, so it, it, various steps at the time. It was, you know, time to do this, time to do that. I did a lot of help on um, on annotating the letters and um, I a bunch of the stuff that's in the letters volume was, um, was um, at least the annotations in that was, was stuff I, I looked in on and, and submitted. And some of the letters I found, like when I was going through Houghton Mifflin's um, files, I found this one typed transcription from a Tolkien letter from 19... 38 that said, you know, Tolkien's description of a hobbit. And, you know, so that um, that got immediately, Comfrey saw it and he says, oh, this has to go in the book. So it's in there. It's uh, it's early in the book from early, I think it's March 1938. We, we you know, dated it, but it's got the, um, the Is it? ear, ears it's, only it's, slightly or quote unquote pointed in Elvish. Yes, I was saying about the, the ears in which he says the elvish ears of the hobbits. Yep, that's that's where that came from. So um nice. It, it's nice. It's this description was no. in the, the letter. No. no, no, that that actually is from the dust wrapper flap that Tolkien actually wrote it, for the first edition of the Hobbit. It's it's the physical description of a hobbit. I I'm probably quoted it in the annotated Hobbit, so it's in there somewhere, mm -hmm. you know. But it's not yes. the, not the bit on the cover. Okay. Did I get your question, Inez, or did I ramble off into some? No, no. <laughs> it's like it was something natural. No, it not yeah. one, just one moment. You began to work with Humphrey Carpenter, right, and then it all developed from here. Right. From it it just so, develops. It it yeah. was never. It was never a sense a of I set out that I'm going to, you know, do Tolkien stuff. So <laughs> it just sort of grew. Sometimes we don't realize when we start to be crazy. I, I know what yeah. you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> Usually starts with a, a book in a Tolkien's book. Well, that's my question. The Annotated Hobbit was a huge project full of research, pictures, and references. Please, tell us about the process of building the book, what decisions you have had to make, things you haven't had to choose, and eventually things you have, you have to discard. Um, how many hours do we have here? <laughs> <laughs> um, Basically, when I suggested the book, I went up to my university library and I got about 15 or 20 annotated books. 
some were Isaac Asimov's annotated this, and I forget who all the other ones were beyond like um, um, the annotated Lewis Carroll was, is, is one of the best ones of, that anybody had done. Um, Martin Gardner. Martin Gardner. Um, and um, so I looked at them to try to get an idea about what people expected or had done in regard to what was annotated. I wanted the foreign illustrations from very beginning um, because I thought they exemplified how Tolkien had been accepted worldwide. You know, uh, in, a, in a way that you can say, okay, oh, he was translated into 40 or 50 or now 70 some 80 languages. But when you see the illustrations that were done, you know, by native artists in their own language, you know, as the book is translated into their languages, you see how they are interpreted in different ways. And, you know, you look at like um, um, the Bulgarian um, artists they're, who the Russian did, uh, one, yeah. and the, the Russian uh, one, a gold. They, they're they're very <laughs> Eastern European, you know, and and the Russian one is very Russian, and and some of the most the the char most charming ones I always thought were the um, the ones by Merit Karnumis from the Estonian. They they captured a fairy tale quality more so than some of the others, and I had so many of the illustrations, but I was unfortunately limited because I had these black and white ones mm. for the most you part. Also, uh, you also, we have here, I think it's two pictures from Antonio Quadros from the Portuguese first edition of The Hobbit that was called Gnomo. They're like Gnomo. small, round <laughs> beings, <laughs> all cute. <laughs> And they, and all of the, the characters in that edition have these enormous noses. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, but, but yeah, much, it's... Too much childish. It's, it um it's, so um I eventually started doing a slideshow and when I would go around to, to promote the book or or um the annotated Hobbit, I would take the slideshow with because I could show basically the story of the Hobbit from the beginning to end, and how it's been interpreted by various artists and cultures and whatever you know. So it's it's quite a fun, you know, thing from that point of view. Um, what what else? What uh, of course. There was a 14 year gap between the first and the second edition, which um, um, I was 28 when the first edition came out. So I guess I was 42 when the second edition came out, um, which, which one hopes one learns a bit more in the passage of time. And so the, the book was, and, and there had been such a, an uh, explosion of Tolkien criticism as well as original Tolkien publications that we'd never seen before, that the book was inevitably vastly more complex. Um, and when I get to the finishing the third edition, it will be another step forward in that in the same sense of that too, because there's been you know even more that's come out since. As to regard to um, evolving and Reduction. Um, the one thing that I um, I have to I have a little article I'm not quite finished with, but it'll probably go up on um, Journal of Tolkien Research. But um, it's on Joseph Medlaner, um, who was the German artist who did Der Bergheist, um, the Mountain Spirit, the art, um, which Tolkien preserved as a little postcard, yeah. and and he wrote on the envelope "Origin of Gandalf." It's not. It's physic. It's chronologically impossible because mm -hmm. the card that Tolkien saved was printed in 1934, which is four years after Tolkien um, had written a bunch of The Hobbit. So it, it 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 he must have seen it at the time and. Years later, when he went through and annotated his papers, he said Origin of Gandalf. Well, it really wasn't. It was just something visual that corresponded to his view of Gandalf. So that's that's some, you know, uh, something that needs to be fixed because yeah, maybe he looked at it and said, oh, this is like the Gandalf I imagine. And that's it. Yep. And I, I believe Humphrey Carpenter uh, took this this as a a, a a true thing because he saw this 
the envelope saying uh, the origin of Gandalf and he didn't match the dates. Nobody knew the dates until, you know, 10 years ago. Uh, so um, so... Um, there, there's a German publication, which they which is is actually quite nice. Um, oh, I don't have it reachable right here, um, but it's a big photo book on Med Laner's life and career. And they show the um, contracts he signed for this series of six postcards and um, you know, and, and the contract was signed in December 33 and they came out in February 34. So, you know, it's, it's quite documented now, whereas it wasn't beforehand. But um, one of the things Humphrey regretted about mentioning that in the biography was he said to me in, in 1980, uh, that long ago, he said, um, he said he regretted not putting that postcard a picture of it in the book because he got more inquiries about that than almost anything else. And so I really wanted to have that in the annotated Hobbit. And um, we had troubles finding it. Um, eventually at the last minute, Rainer Unwin turned it up and he had a, a, a photograph of it taken and sent it over to the American publisher and it got in as a black and white thing at the last minute. And so I was, I sort of felt glad, I was sorry we couldn't, didn't do color, but um, then when it came time for the second edition, um, I asked, you know, can we find this again and get a color? And nobody found it, nobody could find it. Um, and I went uh, and digging in my stuff from the first edition, the files of it, I found that Rainer had sent a color transparency of the postcard. So I in fact had a color version of it, though I didn't remember it. And I sent that to Houghton Mifflin. And three months later, I get this frantic call from my editor at Houghton saying, you know, on a Wednesday saying, we have to go to press on Friday and we don't have that. Can you overnight it to us? And I said, but I already did, <laughs> you know, three months ago. And they, and, and they went looking everywhere. And, they, and it eventually turned out that um, the one person who I had, they, they called me back a number of times. I had to describe the package in which I'd mailed it, what it looked like and, and stuff. And they had to get in touch with somebody who was, um, who was out of the country and who remembered that he thought he had it in his office and then they found it. And it was like four o'clock on Friday evening when the pre book was going to press at five, but they got it and it made it in the color insert. So as far as I know, no one has still found that card. Whatever happened after Rainer Unwin had it in 1987, I don't know. No, but, your memory, it's amazing. And the, <laughs> the deep of details, uh, <laughs> in the day, about the, the hour, about the people, just amazing. I'm, I'm loving it. <laughs> I'm, I'm getting very, very interested in this book about Madlena now. Maybe I can, I can get it somewhere. Um, I happen to read in, in German, so may not be too complicated. Anyway, we have. Oh, it's don't, somewhere. It's don't, somewhere don't, on the shelves over there. Don't um, worry. Well, email, email me, and, and I'll I'll give you the title afterwards, and I will know, I'll give you the ISBN and that. So. I will. Thank you. Uh, years go by. Forty years have gone by now. How do you how do you evaluate the studies on Tolkien over the years? Which aspects? in these last, say, 40 years, which aspects were overstudied and which aspects are still open to new discoveries? Um, and let's not talk question. about Balrog's wings and, <laughs> and stuff. No, that's, um, we, we had a distinction at Tolkien studies of, of we were primarily interested in Tolkien studies, not Middle Earth studies. Mm -hmm. And whether Balro Balrogs had wings or not is Middle Earth studies. Uh -huh. You know, it's it's details <laughs> within the created world. Um, if if there was something that somebody found a letter that said Tol that Tolkien gave more information about it, that would have been Tolkien studies. So. Um, um, much of what we would call Middle Earth studies is um, 
has been argued over and over and over, like you say. Um, but the field of Tolkien studies is completely open-ended. Um, one finds all sorts of new things from every decade in the last four or five you know, uh, decades where certain aspects come to the forefront and certain aspects recede. Um, the only sad thing I've noticed in the last five or so years is um, there has been a bashing of Humphrey Carpenter um, and his biography. Um, and I think for completely unwarranted reasons. Um, there's one new book where it says, you know, Tolkien, um, uh, you know, um, Carpenter says Tolkien had very little knowledge of modern literature. And so it, it, it bashes him on that, but that was pretty much what Tolkien himself would have said, you know, and, and to the reader of the time, you can read between the lines. I mean, you know, Tolkien did not have a very um, thorough grasp of modern literature, but he tried it here, there, here, there, over there, and another place. So um, to, to bash Carpenter for that is, is I think, uh, a large fault. Um, you know, and, and they tend, people tend to forget that, um, that Christopher Tolkien and Humphrey crafted that book and its shape together themselves, and the Tolkien family approved what was in there. So, um, you know, they can't just say, oh, Carpenter was completely wrong on this, but yeah. And it's but not they do. quite fair because he's, he can't de defend himself anymore, so. Right. Well, I'll try to defend him because <laughs> I learned, he and I, I learned more from him and Christopher Tolkien than I ever did from university professors. No, I had a few. I had a few good, you know, professors who I learned a lot from. Like um, Alison Lurie was one, and she just passed away. You know, ninety four. You know, this past year. So, um, you know, but you know, so I can't. I don't mean to knock my professors like that, but I did learn more about what it was meant to study literature, how you, how you do the work, how you present the work. Uh, from those two people more so than anybody else, you know, by far. It's nice that you brought this topic because I made the same question to Wayne and Christina about the, the last years, uh, the bad things people say about Humphrey Carpenter. They didn't say anything bad about him. They just said that uh, he didn't have full access to all the materials we had in later years. Right. And, but they didn't say, uh, they didn't bash the Carpenter's books and, but so they- he, he, uh, he was able to see lots of stuff that didn't get published for, you know, five, 10, 20 years. Um, and he, it, the point of the book, it was really the first thorough biography of Tolkien that was ever done. Um, and it, um, you know, that was the point to present it, to present to the world yes. how Tolkien, in a sense, viewed himself. And even now, what is it, 45 years later, it still pretty much does that. I mean, you could put footnotes here and there to say, you know, something like, um, oh, he was wrong about the origin of Gandalf, you know, the Joseph and, Medlaner. And it's and, funny you know, because, you, go on, go on. Oh, I mean, you. so you could f make little corrections here and there, but I don't think the thrust of the book um, is really that far off. And it's had a good staying power because he did such a thorough job on it in the first place. And it's funny because all the other biographies, they all, it's like uh, Carpenter uh, gave us a, a, a script and all the others follow that script and some, they change some things, add some other things, but it's the, the, the backbone the of them, the, yeah, it's like the thing. Yes. Yeah. It's the same framework, right, you know. The, so the only thing, the, okay, Ronald. No, I was just uh, going to tell Doug that Sergio and I have a vested interest in this biography. It was my first uh, Tolkien translate, uh, Tolkien related translation, uh, ah. 
20 years back or so, and then they changed the editors and uh, Sergio did a thorough review and update of the uh, of the text of the whole text, which was finally republished by um, by uh, the Brazilian, the new Brazilian editor. Okay. Yes. The, the only thing I, I, I kind of dislike about Carpenter is because Last, I believe last year I prepared a, a video to the, the channel about Carpenter's life and I, I found some, some material saying that he kind of disliked Tolkien by the end of his life. He, he said some things, he, he kind of took some arguments with the Tolkien family, I believe. The radio. It's... Um, it's far more complicated than that. Um, t uh, Humphrey, and, he, and when I first got to know him, he was quite open about it. He viewed the Tolkien biography as a stepping stone of he wanted to do more serious biographies, and he did. He went on and did um, the W.H. Auden. He did Ezra Pound. He did um, uh, some of the angry young men uh, you know, like Colin Wilson was covered in a in a multi-person biography, and um, and um, the Inklings oh, is also Brian, a reference book. Yeah, and he, yeah, and he did the um, it, with his wife. They did the Oxford um, Children's Literature Companion, um, and he wrote some children's books himself. Uh, but he clearly he found the Tolkien the Tolkien. Um, people overwhelming in the sense that um, when he uh, what he said was when he would finish a project his interest in it dropped afterwards almost to nothing and um, mm -hmm. the people would keep wanting more information from him and he <laughs> wanted to move on and so he started giving short responses and, and you know and, and sort of argumentative things to sort of put people off um and and i, and I think those took on a sort of rolling stone of their own plus in a sense got in with the um the modern lit crowd in London who always disparaged Tolkien. So he was speaking to different audiences at different times. And he didn't want to go back and do Tolkien much, but occasionally he was sort of dragged into it because of his past associations. And so some of what he, you know, how he came across in his, in the, that last decade and a half before he died is frustrating to to you know some of us who's been devoted for years but um but all i i'm just saying how the biography on its own stands i've written i for the um for the second volume of tolkien studies i wrote an obituary for carpenter who um had died in january just about as we were going to press for that volume and i had to write that obituary in two days and um try to give an account of um what how i felt of how he changed his views over the years so if you guys don't know that you should have a look at it because i think that um i read it okay so then, oh, then nice. you know you'll um i i felt proud in the sense that you know um that it only took yeah i did that in two days and humphrey would have been proud of that because he was he was an amazingly quick study on things um at one point when i went back over and visited him while we were working on the Auden stuff um he needed he he asked me to pick up uh, uh, you know something um uh, uh something with one of his typewriters or something so i brought it over and and he and when i was there the typewriter repairman came and he had his ibm selectric too and and he was telling the typewriter repairman that says well it, it sticks when i when i type you know ion you know and 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 so the guy would try to type it he never got any sticks and he and said well you try it. show me what you do so humphrey sat down at his desk pulled up his chair lifted up two fingers like this and he went <laughs> <laughs> See, and I've never seen anyone type two fingers that fast, you know. Uh, but but he was, and and it was all you know, clear English, no mistakes. But he the same thing with um, you know, you look at what he did was um, 
with um, the Tolkien book, and then he went on and did the Inklings book. Well, that was, in a sense, Rainer Unwin's idea, because he'd done the Tolkien book, and it, and it had done well, and so Rainer asked him, would you do a book on the Inklings? And Humphrey said, oh, um, well, I've already done all the research for it, so yeah. And he sat down, and he wrote that entire Inklings book in three weeks. And then once he'd done that, they said, oh, do you want to do a volume of Tolkien's letters? And he sort of grumbled a little bit, but he, he said, OK, you know, and he did that. And uh, but after that, he pretty much moved away from Tolkien and, and went on into, you know, other modern literary figures. Good, good explanation. Thank you. Mm, next question. Uh, it, re it has to do with another author that I like a lot. Uh, is it possible to compare Tolkien's legendarium to Robert E. Howard's Hyborian Age? Regardless of the dates of publishing, do you think Howard may be considered America's counterpart to Tolkien regarding fantasy literature? Um, in short, no, because there's a better candidate um, who wrote at the same time period. His name was Austin Tappan Wright. He wrote a book called Islandia which um, he died in a car accident in 1931. And he wrote this thousand page novel called Ni Islandia about this imaginary continent. Um, he never quite says in which ocean it is, but from, you can figure it out, it's, it's in the Atlantic between, um, between Brazil and Portugal, as a matter of fact, you know, somewhere <laughs> in there. Um, and he wrote ancillary volumes with, um, histories with languages, with um, plants, all sorts of sub-creation in a way that, you know, is something we are entirely familiar with from Tolkien. None of it was published in his lifetime. Um, his daughter, his, his widow and his daughter got it published in 1942 in an abridged form. And it's, it's sort of been a, a minor classic in the US. It never got um, much attention I think outside the U.S., but he's, he's certainly the most comparable um, writer in terms of world building in the U.S. of the same time. Now, what Howard did is something different, and I think um, if Howard wouldn't have killed himself at the age of 30 and kept writing until his 60s, we might have seen something similar grow out of it, but I just don't think there's enough of a of an existing corpus to really, mm -hmm. you know, make it's too more many some, comparisons. Some tales and they kind of dialogue with each other a little, but it's right. not a continuity. Right. Yes. But if, if he would have had more time, perhaps he would have, you know. The, the only problem, perhaps, because he used, for example, he created Solomon Kane and wrote a lot about him and then uh, forgot about him. So came Cole, then Conan, and every character he, he kind of put aside. Well, I mean, and that in a sense was kind of writing for the market because this editor liked this character and then all of a sudden wasn't employed at that magazine anymore. And so yeah. what did he do? He went to a different character. Yeah. Okay. Okay, and so this? my turn again. Uh, in the annotated Hobbit, we find some poetry uh, written by Tolkien. Some of um, uh, the Tolkien poems are really hard to find. Do you think that, that someday we will have a book with most of his poems? Oh, I, I imagine they'll do it at some point. Nice. You know, I don't see why they wouldn't. They've you know, done everything they, else. They, yeah, they do everything, <laughs> so why not? We the, need po it. the poems are complicated. Um, because, uh, uh, you know, in a sense, um, Tolkien wanted to publish a collection right in 1916, right before he went off to war. It was called The Trumpets of Fairy. But he basically reworked to that basic collection a number of times. He tried to get Blackwell's to publish it in 1926, and they turned it down. And he tried again, you know, in the mid 30s, and they turned it down, and, and another turned it down. And so, in a sense, all we ever got of his poetry was little sprinklings here and there. And if you read it in a context of when it was written and how it changed, you know, um, it's, it's surprising how he could take a poem that was written in 
you know, 1914 and give it a new context in 1924 and give it a third context in the 40s or 50s. And they're nearly the same poem, but they read differently within how they are framed. So um, it, it would be a complex book to-, um, to We can have something with. like the annotated poems of J.R.R. Tolkien, so. <laughs> I'd like to see it. With uh, 10 versions of the same poems. Why and, not? Uh, the first version, the second one. It's a I'm history sure. of the uh, poems. Yeah. We are going to read it all. <laughs> and Christopher, Christopher put a bunch of them in the you know various volumes in yeah. the commentary of the history of Middle Earth. So, but there's still a bunch that aren't, and um, some of them are quite interesting. So, from all the aspects of Tolkien's works, which is the one that fascinates you most, and why? Maybe the mysteries of fairy and its magic. That's almost impossible to answer because it shifts <laughs> and it's so much in a sense. Um, I've had a long back and forward relationship with the essay on fairy stories for many years. I remember I first read it in you know, the Tolkien Reader in about 1974, and it was so way over my head, you know, um, that you know, I had to go back over the years. And in, um, in the early 90s, I asked Christopher if I could have permission to um, get microfilms of the manuscripts of On Fairy Stories from the Bodleian. It was, they were already deposited there. So um, I did, and the idea was maybe to do an edition of it, um, of, of the manuscript. And it was... Um, it still was kind of over my head then, but I had a better, much better grasp upon it. And then other things just um, happened and I didn't get back to it. Um, and Verlin Flieger kept saying, Doug, are you going to do anything about that? And I said, I don't know. And, and then she sort of said, well, how about if we do it together? And I said, okay, that sounds interesting because, um, because her expertise came at it from a different way from mine. And the two of us together made a much better book, I think, than either one of us could have done on their own. Um, and, you know, we did have frustrations getting that, that, that um, published. I mean, it was... Um, you know, it was obvious that, you know, Harper Collins would be the person, the, the firm to ask. And we, um, we approached them and they said, not now. And they said, oh, try us again in six months. So we'd try them again in six months. And, and um, I remember they, they put it off for a year and a half or more. Um, and until finally, um, Christopher said something to them about, you can't just repackage the Lord of the Rings all the time when there's something important you could be doing as well. And then all of a sudden it was like, oh, 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 how soon can you have it done? And it's like, well, if you would have just authorized it a year and a half ago, we would have been done with it. And so it, it you know, um, it took its, its course then and we did it and it came out and um, it hasn't, it, it's been done okay for them. I guess there is a certain amount of market for um, odd Tolkien items that, they can sell to, but not much more. Um, so they did a first printing of the hardcover that sold out at once. So they did a second printing, which didn't sell very well at all. Um, and then it took them some, you know, and they tried to get the American publisher, Houghton Mifflin, to do it, and they turned it down. Um, and then when it came to the point of them printing the books, they said, do you want us to print some for you in America, Houghton Mifflin, and just add it on to our print run with your title page, and Houghton Mifflin said no. Um, I mean, it sounds like a no-brainer to us as Tolkien scholars or, or people interested in it, but, but um, they, it still is only exists in the British edition, which eventually came out in paperback, and then um, I believe has been reprinted a few times. So, so some people, you know, it's getting to people, but um, not through all the usual channels. 
Also, the most part of the Berlinfliger Berlinfliger's books was um, university publications. Right. It's it's um, I don't know how they call university academic. print. Yeah, academic. Yeah, academic. Yes, academic like, texts. Uh, Ring yep. Sands and Fairy. It's a, a great book and was printed in a university. Right. Uh, we were wondering, uh, Doug, how was your relation with the late Christopher Tolkien? How did you first get in touch with him? And what was your relation along the years? Um, I first got in touch with him through Humphrey Carpenter. Um, and like and this would have been about 1980. So we had a good almost four decades. I, rem I you know, it's it's a strange thing to correspond with someone extensively without meeting them. So we'd, we'd corresponded quite heavily for like seven years before we actually met. We met at the Marquette Conference uh, in 1987, the 50th anniversary of the Tolkien, con you know, of The Hobbit in 1987. So, um, but we got to know each other fairly well by then, you know, so, but it was, it was kind of, he clearly loved um, corresponding with people. Um, and he was much, he didn't like open-ended questions, but he loved specific details. So if you, if you approached him with, I found this, this is, you know, I can't figure out this. What do you know about that? Oh, there, um, I see Cesar has some, uh, a photo of, um, you know, he would get quite absorbed in it. And, and you know, um, I mean, it could be almost anything. I mean, at one point um, I had found this um, who's who entry for his father from 1925 that listed among his publications, selections from Chaucer, 1925. And so I sent him that page and he knew nothing about it. And then, you know, 10 years later, you know, Wayne and Christina found the manuscript of selections from Chaucer in the Oxford University Press archives. And now years later, we've got um, John Bauer's book on it and with another one forthcoming. So it's, you, you can see how he got interested in various things. And one other, um, um, uh, this would have been about 1983, a friend of mine, um, I lived in upstate New York then, and a friend of mine I worked with um, asked me, um, he lived outside of town, uh, and, and asked me, oh, do, was I interested in Tolkien's collected poems? Uh, and, you know, of course, I, I thought, oh, uh, you know, he said, oh, I saw it in a, in a used bookshop down where I live. And I thought, well, his collected poems, you mean Adventures of Tom Bombadil? And he's like, no, 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 it was collected poems. Um, and I said, well, I don't, I don't understand, because, um, you know, he said, oh, it's kind of old. And the next time I saw him, he brought it to me and gave it to me as a gift. It was the collected poems of James Kenneth Tolkien, who was a Canadian American, um, <laughs> born in Canada, who come to Buffalo, and that's where he published his, his poetry. And it had this long introduction about... Um, about his family history, including these um, Tolkien brothers who were in the music business and made pianos in Birmingham before they, one of them came to Canada. So I sent the thing to Christopher. I said, um, I, said I thought you this would interest you. And um, um, if, you, if you want to keep it, please do. But if you aren't interested, please send it back because I'll probably never see another copy. And he, you know, thanked me enormously and said it was, you know, very interesting. And of course, he never, he, he went on all about the, um, the family tree of James Kenneth Tolkien would be his second cousin, twice removed downwards. And, and he had it all, you know, Hobbit-like all fill, filled yeah. out as to <laughs> what the relationship was. Um, but he never said anything about the poetry, which is sort of, um, um, it's a step above dog rule in some ways. And, um, and James Kenneth Tolkien had, had actually two other books which recycled some of his poetry. One had been published earlier in Montreal in the t in 93 and the other one in Los Angeles where he moved to in 1928. So so you can see he had this wide ranging interests too and and anything that you could um that stimulated him was it was always uh fascinating 
you know, um, correspondence back and forth. You never knew what you were going to get in the next in the next letter one way or another. So um, I and like I said before, I learned more from him and Humphrey than I learned from any other source. So I guess you would call them mentors or mm -hmm. or something, but I've been very grateful for it. You know, and it was a nice thing that I was able to um, to say that to Humphrey just a year or two before he died, you know, and it was like one of our last exchanges of letters. I just sort of, you know, said, by the way, I never have, you know, got to express the gratitude of, of you know, what I've learned from you. Just, you know, right back and, th and said it was worth it. Good, you know, good for you, so. <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, as we are remembering things from the past, the next, next question also about the past. Uh, what curious or interesting fact you have to tell us about the Token Centenary Conference in 1992? Mm. I'm, I'm um, always curious about this event, this, this celebration, because it was a once in a lifetime opportunity to, to gather so many people, so many token experts and i believe it was a unique event oh yeah and and i remember um you know one of the highlights being you know christopher tolkien did a reading of the then unpublished new shadow you know it, it had not been published yet but he read that out loud in lieu of giving any sort of speech or or talk like that and that was a high point there was lots of good papers there. I remember um, Vera Chapman gave one. She was the she was then in her early nineties, probably about ninety four at that point, and um, and she gave a talk about what it was like to be an Oxford student. Bella woman, Donna Yep, Bella Donna Took at, at Oxford as a woman in nineteen eighteen, and. Um, I sat with Priscilla Tolkien. She um, even talks and, about the, 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 the influenza pandemic from 1918, I believe, in that paper. Mm -hmm. And that's how it, it was nice to be there. Um, there, were, there were various groupings, then, you know, and um, Cesar showed the photograph of um, Verlin and Christopher and I in, at Keeble College. Um, uh, you know, there, there was just so many wonderful things. It's really hard to pull them out and of course it was what 30 years ago now almost <laughs> so we can only imagine how nice it was well one wishes one had um some of the tech that one has nowadays back then but you know Christina, Christina exactly. told, talk about uh, very a lot about the conference she she has a incredible memory too who has Christina Scope. Oh, Christina, Christina Scope. yeah. Oh, she would she would know more than almost anyone because she was one of the Tolkien Society people organizers. Who were organizers. So um, yes. I'm sure there was there's you know as compared to those of us who were just there to experience it, I'm sure she has hosts of further memories. She did tell us a lot. Okay, now it's Inez? my turn uh, talking about Christina. We have here a question about his husband since we have already interviewed them um it was the last interview uh how was it to work with uh, j wayne g hammond in jr tolkien's uh, descript descriptive biography and in the academic journal Tolkien studies um i uh, wayne and i got in touch in the mid Eighties, or you know, about because we we heard from other people that we were both sort of doing the same thing, and we combined our research. And when it came time that we were approached by a publisher, I had just um, taken over a bookstore, and um, and the workload was tremendous. And I said to Wayne, "You go ahead and do it." And and that and so that's why it appears as by Wayne Hammond with my assistants. Yeah, so I'm a sort of secondary co-author rather than a primary co-author like Verlin and I did with um, the Tolkien on fairy stories. Um, I don't know why you brought up Tolkien studies because we didn't do anything with, I didn't do anything with Wayne for that. Was there, was, 
Was no, it was link? just because he worked in the the. the oh, yeah. oh, you don't the mean the journal? Yeah. You just mm -hmm. yeah, no, because he he wasn't part of the journal. That was yeah, Mike yeah. Drought and and Verlin and I. So um, yeah, yeah. And that. But but those were the old days of um, you know of of everything going by mail, you know. Um, so Wayne and I sending stuff back and forth, and you know by postal, not um, not email. It's quite different, you know. <laughs> well, the annotated Hobbit first came out in 1988, and later a revised. Re revised and expanded edition came in 2002. Since at least 2019, there has been rumors about the third edition. What can you tell us about this? Um, it's in the it's works. Coming? And well, it's yeah. not set and I'm not finished it. I had, um, I was working fine on it. Um, and then um, my house got hit by lightning which fried what? all my electronics. Wow. What? <laughs> it blew my computer. Um, I had, well, and it did, it, it fried out strange things, electronics. Um, it, it blew out my controls on my oven as well, you know, um, which is not something you would really think <laughs> of. But um, it's not that I didn't have backups. I had backups, but some of them weren't quite current. But I had to jump from um, an ancient operating system to, you know, all of a sudden up to Windows 10. And a bunch of the programs I used for scanning, for OCRing, for, you know, uh, images and everything, I had to get new ones that were all different and weren't compatible with some, I mean, it was, it was disheartening is, is not quite strong enough a word, but, um, but it's still in the works. Oh, so, um, you know, damn Thor. <laughs> damn Thor. Yes. <laughs> is there an, an expectation about dates? I don't like giving expectations about dates because I have a tendency of not to make them. So, um, <laughs> you know, yeah, um, the like when I did the second annotated Hobbit, I um, I basically piled everything on one end of a long table and I worked through it and I piled it as I finished it on the other end of the table and reshelved um, and. The with the it's similar with the third edition, but it's like all of a sudden, I think I've made progress, and then six more books have come out, and they go on top of the pile again. So, and some of them aren't relative, you know, end up not being particularly relative to relevant to the Hobbit, but some of them are especially relative, you know. And it's like when when um, when. Um, uh, the Bodleian exhibit, exhibition book came out and it had this wonderful quote from John's, uh, you know, January 1st, 1930 diary saying that his father had just read them a few chapters of The Hobbit. That was wonderful because that gave us a firm date at which, you know, the, some of the Hobbit had actually been written. And we never had that before. I mean, we had mm -hmm. nebulous sort of things of, of enough of what was done in, you know, the end of 32 or the beginning of 33 to be shown to C.S. Lewis. But, you know, that idea of, um, of um, um, Tolkien saying the infamous anecdote that he was sitting at his desk, cramp, you know, correcting examination papers when he found a blank page and wrote in a hole in the ground, there lived a hobbit. Um, you know, there, the, um, you couldn't date that. It could have been 27, 28, 29, it could have been 30, but this sort of moves it, uh, you know, in, in at least more firm, um, you know, a, a realm of speculation. But of course, that also brings up problems too, because it shows another instance of Tolkien's memory in the 60s not being very accurate, because he said in the um, Tolkien at Oxford program, um, he said, I can remember 
It was there in my corner of my at my desk in the study at number you know twenty North Ware Road, right there. I can see it in my mind. Uh, well, he moved into number twenty North Moore Road in January nineteen thirty. You know, um, which would then seem to place this writing of in a hole in the ground in the Hobbit that summer. But if John Tolkien wrote in January of 19, 1st of 1930 that he'd been read two chapters of The Hobbit, it clearly had been written in the previous house, which was next door at number 22 North. Two. Yes. So, um, so you get, there are a number of other instances. Tolkien late in life um, went through his papers and annotated them. And he put dates on things and, um, and it's going to take us years to sort of sort that out as to how can we how we much of that can we trust? Mm. how much of it can we trust was that a when when christopher says merely that you know this poem says such and such date on it you know oh 1914 um you know that sounds all good but when you look at the manuscripts and you find that there are three other manuscripts of that poem one of which was dated you know firmly contemporarily you know you know march 1913 uh, then you question the ones that were in this little black handwriting you know black ink in the corner you wonder about like things um um the gondolin painting that is dated 1928 you know in that black ink on the page and it makes you wonder you know is that something he wrote on 40 years later and was just remembering or can we take that you know we'll we'll be we'll be asking these questions for years <laughs> i have been given uh, doug i have been given a question to ask you actually it's a question we were all wondering about we should should have read the book but i don't think any of us has really read it uh, maybe you can tell us about The Marvelous Land of Snurgs by E.A. Wyke Smith. How does that relate to The Hobbit? You have written on it, of course. We haven't read the book yet, but if you could give us some idea. It's, it's, a, it's a fun book. It came out fun. in 1927. Mm -hmm. um, it's definitely a children's book. It's about, and, and it's got a very unusual beginning. Um, these, um, this woman named Miss Watkins lives in this isolated bay where she um, runs the SR SL, the Society for the Removal of Superfluous Children, which basically means she runs around England and when she sees children being maltreated by their parents, she pulls out a um, some sharp or bludgeonous object and beats the parents over the head and kidnaps the children. And she takes them off to this bay, Watkins Bay, where the Snurgs live by. And she raises them there where they can be happy away from. So she, the story basically follows two such children, um, you know, Sylvia and Joe. And Joe had been, um, had been um, an acrobat with his father and one day when he goofed up something his father came up with him and and let him have it and all of a sudden this elderly woman who'd been sitting in the cheap seats came up with a big pair of tongs and and father knew no more else nothing else for hours and when he did wake up his son was gone and joe was running happily with the snurgs you know in this uh, in this place but what happens in the in the story is joe and sylvia meet this snurg who's named gorbo now, snurgs are these half-high creatures, just like hobbits, um, who um, have parties and, um, you know, and, and are reluctant to go on adventures. And, you know, so, so the book came out in September 1927. And I think um, the original dust wrapper of it has a quote on it that would have caught Tolkien's eye. We know that Tolkien fell in love with Peter Pan when he saw it performed on stage in Birmingham in, was it 1911? Um, and the cover of the Snurds book says, you know, for all those who enjoyed Peter Pan. So Tolkien bought it for his children and they loved it. Michael in particular loved it. And they made up a bunch of stories. They wanted more adventures of Snurgs. 
So um, um, they made up some of their own, and Tolkien started telling them the story about this half-high creature named, you know, a hobbit named Bilbo. So I think you can then put the origin of the hobbit as to post September 1927, because he would have had to have read the story to his kids to have them wanting a similar story. So it was probably 1928 that it that it you know it, it first got underway, you know. Um, but but that's the, the Snurg's book is quite fun, and that was um, um, uh, it was actually kind of hard to find out anything about the author E. A. Wykesmith. Um, I didn't find anything before the first edition of the annotated Hobbit came out, but around the time it was being published, I finally found mo most of the cataloging information give his, gives his name under Smith as Smith, comma, E.A. Wyke. Um, and I finally found someone in London just after the annotated Hobbit first came out, um, listed as A. Wykesmith. So I wrote away to A. Wykesmith at this London address and, and said, are you any relation to, to this? And I remember I sent it on a Wednesday and I got to my the bookstore at which I then worked on Monday morning to find that I'd had a telephone call from Angela Wykesmith in London. Um, and she called back and it, sure enough, um, that was her grandfather and, and her family had always thought that Tolkien had stolen the Snurgs you know, from, <laughs> from their father's book. And, it, and um, oh. so it, it took us some years, but we got the book republished um, and I wrote the introduction for it and, um, and that. And, and I sent it to, you know, I, Christopher didn't remember much about the book at all. Um, though he read the introduction before it got published. And um, then when it was published, I sent him a copy of the book and he said, he said, um, you know, it's funny how memory works because once he saw all of the illustrations in the book, uh -huh. they jumped out of the page at him as intimately familiar to his memory. But he remembered nothing of the book itself before that, you know, but the illustrations, and, you know, and he knew it was something that was, that was something important to his childhood all those years before so let's read it everybody <laughs> yes i'm ordering ordering mine right now you there you um you guys some of you should translate it in there you know yeah we have some we have a so, portuguese version oh you do of snurgs and really? the and the translator is gabriel Brun. You don't say. Yeah. Okay. So okay, I'll, I'll <laughs> have to read the original and the translation. And Just criticize for... the translation possibly. Okay. I, didn't, I didn't know it had been translated into Portuguese. It actually had, um, had one translation in 1942 before it really sunk um, into Spanish out of Barcelona. Um, mm -hmm. Maravillosa País de los Snergs. Snergs. Uh -huh. This is a Portuguese edition, folks. Ah. Uh, the, just Brazilian for those to know, okay. the translator, Gabriel Brum, is the same who translated the, the letters of J.R. Tolkien a few years ago. Ah, okay. And, and now is now re, re adapting, retranslating, revising the letters for future publication by HarperCollins Brazil. And revised all the, the new editions mm -hmm. of the, the Legendarian. He did. And he did. Wow. He's still working on the History of Middle Earth, a Brazilian edition. It's he a is. big name uh, among us. Wow, great. But yeah. this, this Brazilian, this Portuguese this is edition, is um, pequena tiragem, eh, Ronald? Um, it came out in uh, small numbers. Um, it was not a large, uh, large edition, but a large small print. edition. Uh, yeah. yeah. A maravilhosa terra dos snurks. But yeah. we don't have here a Portuguese edition. I was looking for it, and the only yeah. I only uh, can find the Brazilian one. Okay. It's a hair one here. Yeah. It's rare, yeah. Okay, one more to order. But, yeah, it, it's here in Amazon with uh, free shipping in Amazon.br. So buy Wonderful. it. Wonderful. I'm gonna buy I it. I will. I will first. Already am. 
All right, make your notes. <laughs> <laughs> so, Doug, uh, going back again to Humphrey Carpenter, I believe you you already answered a little of this question. But uh, how did you come to work with him, with Humphrey, Humphrey Carpenter, on the letters of J.R.R. Tolkien? And what kind of assistance did you give him? And the second part of the question, uh, do you think someday we'll see an expanded edition of this book? It seems like Christina Skoll would love to do it. Um, I got involved because when, they, when Humphrey first put together the selection, they wanted somebody who was knowledgeable about Tolkien, um, but not an Oxford, you know, somebody who was not of Oxford or England, who could, you know, suggest maybe you need to explain this or, or, you know, and so that was, was a lot of my role was I had sent various things that I'd found and said, you, you know, you might want to look at this, try that. And then he sent me the first draft, I don't typescript of it. And, and then I sent a big commentary on it saying, you know, I don't know what this means. The, you know, the normal US reader won't understand, you know, whether it be, you know, Oxford Amazon examination schedules, or I, I don't remember precisely what now, but um, it was more sort of sort of filling in the, uh, the gaps. I, um, I know Christina and Wayne would love to do another expanded edition of it, but the estate was not interested in pursuing one for years. I would have been, you know, equally interested in doing one, you know, um, and, and had asked Christopher about it many years ago, even before they did. Um, but um, I imagine there will be one. It was, um, um, I mean, there, there certainly has been more accumulated um, discoveries of letter caches of Tolkien mm -hmm. in the years since. So I imagine it's just a matter of time and, um, and you know, sorting out permissions and, you know. Let's hope it, yeah. it will come out someday. So now, now let's talk about movies and TV shows. Um, when you knew about <laughs> Peter Jackson's movies, the Lord of Rings trilogy, how did you react? Uh, it was a cinema, cinematographic production uh, never seen before and brought many people into Tolkien's Legendarium. And after that, what do you think about the Hobbit the trilogy, uh, the Tolkien's biopic and the upcoming TV series? Um, boy, that's a mouthful. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I was... <laughs> cautiously optimistic when I first heard about Peter Jackson's um, Lord of the Rings films. Um, uh, one of his previous films, the one with Kate Winslet, I'm, I'm blanking on the title right now, um, was actually quite good. And so it made one think, you know, that there was a potential of him um, for approaching it more from an artful point of view than merely as a commercial blockbuster. I think he straddled the line in what he ended up doing. Um, and I said as they were coming out um, that, and, and this remains true, I was not the audience for those films because I, had, I was someone who had worked very closely with the text of the books for many years. So as soon as there was liberties, they were very jarring to me. Um, I, I was happy they were done. They were, you know, um, in a sense, they defined what Tolkien meant to the general population for at least that decade. Um, by the time he got round to The Hobbit, um, I, I think, you know, um, I think the biggest failings of The Lord of the Rings three films was in the script. And I think the failings of the, uh, you know, and they weren't that huge in the first three films, but the problems with that are apparent in the first three films are magnified 
extensively in the three Hobbit films. And I think not only are they bad Tolkien, but they are bad films. They were dull, long, boring. Endless, boring. <laughs> Um, the, the Tolkien biopic, um, I had almost no hope for. And when I saw it, I just hoped that it would pass away quickly and be forgotten because there is not a single scene in there that is accurate biographically. They took lots of biographical moments and toss them into this salad of a film script, um, but none of which was true. You know, whether they, you know, had to expand the character of Edith to be more of an assertive woman, or they had to um, completely invent the idea that the poet G.B. Smith was in love with Tolkien. Uh, it, it was just all unnecessary, and I hope that film passes into its deserved oblivion quickly. The Amazon series, um, I have no hope for really at all, and not much <laughs> interest in either. So um, the, the one thing that it has going for it is it's opening up an area and a time frame of Middle Earth about which we know little. So those involved creatively have a much more free hand to do what they want to do with it. Now, what they want to do with it, which of course we don't know anything about yet, we will see. And it could be anything from really good and really cool to yeah. really bad and really horrible. Uh -huh. So I don't know. I mean, we will just have to wait and see. But I'm not um, knowing, um, knowing how Hollywood treats things commercially. Um, I don't really have much hope. And I, and I suppose I should qualify by that by saying I don't like most adaptations of anything. You know, I mean, the, the few that I thought exceeded um, their source material in different ways was like um, Blade Runner, um, which I, I usually try to read a book before I see it's the film version of it. And as much as I liked Philip Dick's Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep, Blade Runner is not a film of that book, but it's a film of that world. And it works within its own way. I mean, one of the few other things that I, I really thought, there, there was a very small, um, small budget art film done about 10 years ago called Dean Spanley um, from a lesser novel by Lord Dunsany called My Talks with Dean Spanley. Um, it stars um, Peter O'Toole in it. It was one of his last oh. films. And um, oh, well, I'm, I'm, I'm blanking on the main actors uh, who's very well known. Um, oh, I'm just not going to remember it right now. Um, Dunsany's novel, My Talks with Dean Spanley, is about this, um, this vicar who, when he drinks a certain rare brandy, Tokai, he starts reminiscing about his previous incarnation as a dog. And it sounds absurd, and it is. And Dunsany's novel is a sort of light, fun thing, but the screenplay which um, the, the screenwriter evidently worked trying to get it made for like 20 years um, before it was finally done, added a depth to it and some things that weren't in Dunsany that really brings out a much more grander story and it really works nicely. So um, um, if you get a chance, you know, I'd say go for that one. But there, there are other adaptations that are, you know, not horrible or, or, or watchable. Or you, you think of the J.K. Rowling books, the Harry Potter books, which, um, 
you know, it's funny how, you know, what was it the second one that was the closest one to the actual book and it got the worst reviews because it was too close to the book. Um, you know, Actually, it's one of my favorites. <laughs> the, yeah, the yeah. yeah, and, and um, but the idea seems to be that, um, that Hollywood makes changes because they can, because the changes will stir up the fan base either to like it or hate it and stir up more commentary and therefore more ticket sales. So mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's a cynical view of it all, but... <laughs> By the way, the star of that film is Sam Neill. See, yes, there we go. And he's been in many things from, you know, Jurassic Park Dean to, to but, but Dean Spanley yep. was, was it's a, it was a small budget, but, you know, it was really a, an effective film. One more thing to, to write down. Yeah. yeah. I, am. I am. Yes, sir. <laughs> aye, aye, sir. <laughs> Move on, moving on. What's your favorite passage of The Hobbit and your favorite Tolkien drowning? Tolkien drowning? Dra drawing. 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 Oh, okay. Drawing. Oh, okay. Not drowning, which is. I was going to say it's something out of something Zoom and all On the water. <laughs> yeah. No, the drawing is probably the, the Tolkien drawing is, is um, conversations with Smaug. Because when I first saw the original of that, which would have been at the 87 um, Hobbit conference in Marquette, um, they had the, and um, it has, the way Tolkien used some sort of metallic flake on the dragon, um, that it almost glows off the page from it. I've never seen a reproduction that does it justice. And it's just a marvelous, beautiful little, you know, you know uh, drawing. And that, um, and what was your, what was the first part of the question, Cesar? Uh, uh, your favorite passage of passage. the book, of, okay. the ho of, um, the Hobbit. of the Hobbit. Oh, of the Hobbit, probably the Gollum chapter. Yeah. The first one or the second one? <laughs> From um, the, uh... the second one. I would go for the revised one. There, you know, it's, it's funny because, um, um, John Ratliff, who's a dear friend of mine for many years, um, in his History of the Hobbit, prints the um, couple of chapters that Tolkien went at in about 1960 to revise the Hobbit to make it the prequel to The Lord of the Rings. Um, and he says how terrible it is. And I don't think so. I think it would have been fine. I think there's a sort of confirmation bias in that we tend to prefer the one we grew up with reading which is whatever hobbit we had and look at something different as as, as counterfeit in some ways whereas if you can step away from it i think what he did was actually smooth out some of the rough parts and i would have wished he would have gone on with it but john says oh we're so lucky he didn't go on with it <laughs> I, I i love it i yeah i the, the well, whole we're, idea we're the of the, yeah, I, I think it's great. Many versions, the original ones and the more dark ones, maybe. I don't know. We're definitely in the minority there, then, because most people want want the book uh, in the version they knew it when they first encountered it. I usually uh, pose the last question in our interviews and. Again, what, Doug, what are your current and what are your future projects? Um, well, I'm obviously I'm working on AH3, as I always call it, just for shorthand, because it's easier to type. Um, but there are some other things. I've had a, a book of further tales, more tales before Tolkien, that I keep sort of mm -hmm. playing with and accreting. And um, I just need to buckle down and, um, and finish that up. Um, and there's a um, uh, book I put together back in about 2008 that I've blown the dust off and want to get out. Um, um, it's a background reader to Tolkien on fairy stories, um, which um, some of the stuff that we referred to is genuinely rare. 
like we were for Tolkien on fairy stories um, um, in Tolkien's notes that he made in the Bodleian um, he went on about Lang's introduction to the blue fairy book and he wrote several pages of notes well you go to 99% of the editions of the blue fairy book and it has this two or three page preface and none of what Tolkien wrote about was in there. And Verlin and I were flummoxed for quite a while until finally I thought, okay, Tolkien read this at the Bodleian. Let me look in the Bodleian's library's catalog. And what I found there was they had a large paper edition that was limited to like a hundred copies that was intended for adults that had a full 26 page or, or 22, 25 uh, introduction for adults that Tolkien obviously took notes from. So then I looked around and tried to find some other library that would be more convenient to get a copy uh, for, of that introduction. And I found out that the Lilly Library at, in, um, in Bloomington, Indiana had a copy of it. So I corresponded with them and they provided me with a photocopy of that. And then we could finally see that, oh, here, this is the, what, so where Tolkien got some of these ideas from. Well, he did a similar thing with the Red Fairy book. Um, and, and there are other texts that I think that were important from stuff by G.K. Chesterton um, to, um, you know, some of his um, a chapter from Orthodoxy. There's um, um, George MacDonald wrote a couple of essays on the fantastic imagination, um, which Tolkien clearly had read and builds upon in that. So I put together this book uh, I, as an idea and... Um, to, as a companion sort of volume to, um, to Tolkien on fairy stories and Harper Collins just wasn't interested in it at all. So I just put it aside and then, um, then after it got finally came out in paperback and I was talking to somebody else um, at one of the medievalist Congress, um, someone was saying, you know, that would still be great. And I thought, okay, well, I'll pull it out and have a look at it. And I think they're right. It, it still is worth something worthwhile doing, so. Uh, and I, I I don't know if you remember Sergio. I gave to I gave to you the blue the blue book. Yes, yes. Some some years ago from your birthday. Beautiful edition. Uh, yeah, it's a hardcover, uh, and uh, uh, it is about this. And here this year we we start a, a new edition of Fantasies of George MacDonald. It's oh. a great book. The blue book is the, is the Portuguese version or the or the original, the one you gave to sell you? The, the original, it's English one. And that's beside my Peter Pan edition. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Doug, uh, unfortunately, we have to end the interview. We know you're busy. We have talked a lot today and it was terrific. It was so fantastic to, 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 to listen to you all the memories, all the knowledge you brought mm -hmm. to us today. And I'm, I'm very happy even because now I'm recovering from COVID and this ah. interview came in a good time for, for my spirit to, to, to elevate my spirit. Thank you very much. And but it's okay. I, I just got my first shot a few weeks ago. So oh. nice, nice. And hopefully we will get out of this very soon. Uh, so we learned a lot. We, we, uh, we have had a fantastic evening. Uh, it's a great opportunity for the Brazilian public to know you better because uh, your book, the uh, Hobbit Anotado, will come out in June or July, I believe. This June, year. Who, was June. who June. was translating that? Is that you, Cesar, or Ronald, or somebody else? Uh, Ronaldo, uh, Reinaldo José Lopes is the same uh, translator the same? of The Hobbit. Ah. The Silmarillion, too, right? The Silmarillion yeah. and the. Um, he did the Hobbit and the Gondolin. Silmarillion and the oh, Fall of yeah. Gondolin. That's and right. The, because it's two translators, the Hobbit text uh, is Reinaldo José Lopes, and uh, all the notes and commentary. The annotations. Is, the annotation is Guilherme Mazafera. Mazafera. Mazaf Guilherme Mazafera, that's right. I talked to I'm, him yesterday uh, um, about the 
the something about the the, the new book, the, the tokens modern reading, because I shared in Facebook uh, a passage about the cracks of doom, where yeah. where token token took it from, and Guilherme uh, answered. He he, he wrote the, wrote down below the the post. He said, "Oh, Douglas said about it in the annotated Hobbit," and and I said, and, oh, I, yeah. and I I think she's wrong about the, oh, the okay. passage. Because she, she, Tolkien comments on the phrase, you know, cracks of doom, and she only takes the crack as the word, and she dismisses, you know, my comment in particular, um, you know, and, and, and I, I just don't think she's right. I, I, um, Mike Ashley, who's the world authority on Blackwood, and I corresponded it on, on this over the years, and, and he and I have both looked through tons of Blackwood, and we never found that phrase. But there's, there's a, another possibility of, that might be associated with that. I won't go into it now, but I will in the future at some point. But, um, nice. but anyways, I don't, I don't think she was very convincing. I stick to the annotated Hobbit. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I'll let uh, everybody here say goodbye to you. And I hope you come back someday. We have, uh, this was a general interview. Perhaps you can make other ones more specific about other subjects. I hope you'll come back later. Okay, and... I'll be glad to if you, uh, you know, and I want to say thanks for having me. And thanks to you, Inez, Ronald, Sergio, and Cesar. We thank you. We wish to thank you as one of our top interviewees. I think we are getting better and better chaps with these interviews and we're feeling more, more natural, more relaxed. <laughs> and I think uh, this one with Douglas Anderson was definitely one of the, one of the, one of the maxima. Well, thank you. Thank you very, very much, Douglas. Well, I like uh, I like to thank uh, all your kindness and good stories with uh, incredible detail about the the time, the passage, the the people involved. Uh, Christopher Humphrey, it's a great pleasure to know from uh, from the source, yeah. and we we start this this YouTube channel five years ago to improve the, the Tolkien's name and uh, all the readers start to, to study, to discuss. And when we, we start to, to, get, to have some big names like yours on our channel, it's a proof that we are in the right way. Right. Good. And it's a it's a great pleasure, and I just uh, leave the doors open, and the tea is on uh, on the table. You come back when you want it. Thanks. Is it five? Yeah, it's at five yeah. p.m. So I make my friends' words mine. It's such a pleasure to be here with you. Uh, when I joined this channel almost three years ago, I had no idea that I would be talking with such great. Uh, people. So as, as my friend said, it's such a pleasure to be here to learn from the source, like that I've said, and to hear all these memories that you have with some other people, some with other tokenists, with Christopher. So we feel very happy. And now you can also say goodbye to our, to our followers. Thank you. <laughs> well, congratulations on your five years. And it's been a pleasure being here. And I wish everybody, you know, another five years of good times. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. To how our to all our followers, Portuguese, Brazilian, English speakers, everyone, uh, we will have the the subtitles as usual in Portuguese. So thank you for being here with us today. If you can help us subscribe the channel, we are almost reaching. No, maybe we reached. I don't know. <laughs> maybe. By, maybe. One hundred uh, subscribers. So. One hundred thousand. Hundred thousand. Yeah, yeah. Thousand. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, one thousand. Like serious business, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So thank you for being here with us with us tonight. If you want to help us, you can use all the links down below in the description. So it's all for today. I hope. Okay. 
a dog, dog's links will be down below yeah, in the description well. to, to his blog so that everyone can, can go surf through the token and fantasy yeah. blog. So thank you for being here with us tonight. We see you in the next video. Um grande beijinho. Bye. Bye, Bye everyone. Thank, thank you again, Doug. Thank you very much thank for you. your time. <laughs> We're very happy. Okay. Yeah. All right. Bye-bye. Thank Bye. you a lot. Bye-bye.